So it's 2023 and if you're using Tower for Divination, that's amazing. It's an amazing tool to take healing into your own hands, literally. But I want you to know that that's not all. When you start studying Tower more in depth, you notice that some of the earlier tarot pioneers talk less about divination and more about something else. Their language, albeit a little old fashioned, is often abstract, steeped in symbolism, unsurprisingly esoteric, and sometimes frustratingly ostentatious. Kind of like the word ostentatious. For example, books like this, or this, or this. Arthur Edward Waite says of the High Priestess, She has been called occult science on the threshold of the sanctuary of Isis, but she is really the secret church, the house which is of God and man. She represents also the second marriage of the prince who is no longer of this world. She is the spiritual bride and mother, the daughter of the stars, and the higher part of the Eden. She is in fine, the queen of our life, but this is the life of all. She is If I ever said that to a tarot client, I don't think I'd ever see them again. So what's all this stuff about? In this video, we'll be looking at the mystical philosophy that plays an undeniable role in the shaping of tarot. And at the risk of revealing my inner conspiracy theorist, I would say, the whole world. All right, let's be honest. Spirituality is a privilege, or at least aspects of spirituality. It's safe to say that at least in the past, if you had the time and resources to study things like tarot, you probably had your worldly affairs in order, or at least food on the table. A lot of the pioneers that have shaped tarot in the past had money, from the Duke of Milan in the Renaissance to our favorite trust fund baby, Aleister Crowley. The very origin of tarot was a playing card game for royalty. And oftentimes when you're wealthy, you do one of two things. Either you start to meddle around in the lives of others, or you start to peek around in that which is outside of this life. Whether that be your legacy or something transcendental, mystical, occult. We'll be focusing on the latter in this video. For convenience sake, I'm going to propose a term to specify the scope of tarot practice that I'll be referring to in this video. I'm going to use the term transcendental tarot, mostly because it has nice alliteration with those T's and we will be spilling the tea, but also because the mystical philosophy we'll be attempting to understand has a transcendental nature. By transcendental tarot, I'm referring to any aspect of tarot or its associated disciplines that can help in elucidating world experiences or entire realities outside of the scope of one individual life. This is in contrast to divination, which typically focuses on the circumstances of one person's life. It would seem that the transcendental aspects of tarot, with its connections to philosophy and the occult, were mostly for a privileged elite. If you don't have food on the table, you're probably not gonna be concerned with the Shemham Farash or the writings of Plato or the Hermetica. In fact, the profound Jewish mystical tradition of Kabbalah was reserved only for men at the age of 40 who essentially had their shit together. And that makes sense because how are you going to look into other worlds if you don't have your shit together in this one? But don't worry, because today, things are different. Many of the philosophical and occult influences that shaped the transcendental nature of tarot are much more easily accessible. And that's all because of one very powerful spell, the interweb net. Seriously, you can access the whole Corpus Hermeticum with one click for free at a public library. Marsilio Ficino is orgasming in his grave. We can play with this stuff. But even in the past, there are countless instances where class and affluence have no correlation with uh, higher spiritual philosophies and transcendental inquiry. I mean, off the top of my head, I'm thinking Diogenes, the origins of yoga. There's a dichotomy that remains. You'll find that most spiritual practice tends to serve one of two purposes, either the immediate or the transcendental. The magical terms for this would be low magic being immediate and high magic being the transcendental. The lower, the immediate, concerns the practitioner with results in this life. How do I get more pleasure? How do I avoid pain? And these are the questions most asked of the tarot. How do I get paid? How do I get laid? How do I stay unafraid and enjoy my parade? The other type of spiritual practice, higher magic, concerns a sort of deification or self-realization where you are transcending this one life, this world, or all worlds together entirely. This is the quest towards ultimate reality. And this is the subject matter hinted at by authors such as this, this, and this. This divergence from result-oriented causal reality divination to transcendent reality inquiry into the highest spiritual truths were very apparent to me when I started 
digging deeper into the tarot. And that's really where the fun began. Because tarot is great at learning about yourself, but when you start learning about yourself, and then I came upon the Upanishads. Like all of the other super badass, super deep, mind-melting philosophical or spiritual texts, they have a sort of disclaimer. And I found this disclaimer to be so similar to the sort of contradictory modes of tarot that I've been researching for so many years. Now, the Upanishads are part of the Vedas, and the Upanishads explain how most of the Vedas uh, offer you ritualistic practices, things to do, actions to take in order to get specific results, in order to gain more merit, better karma, and better life, or better next life, or higher heaven. But unlike the Vedas, which give you result-oriented action, the Upanishads give you direct knowledge. In this case, the highest spiritual truth is not something you can understand through effort, but something you can only know directly. And when you know this directly, all other efforts and the results of those efforts become meaningless in comparison. From an Advaita Vedanta point of view, all other efforts and results don't even exist. This is the same dichotomy that exists when you read authors like Aleister Crowley or Arthur Edward Waite, the directors of the two most influential tarot decks of all time. Both of them hint at these higher spiritual philosophies and then give a little information on divinatory practice. And this dichotomy seems to exist in all spiritual traditions. Most religions will sell you on take this action and have this belief for this result, and most of them have an inner mystical tradition that is about some sort of direct knowledge or gnosis of the divine. Okay, now I'm gonna give you my hot take quasi pseudo thesis on all this. I propose that by studying these very profound non-dual philosophies and teachings, such as Advaita Vedanta or aspects of Neoplatonism, will give us a profoundly deeper understanding of Tarot's symbolism which will take us from asking questions like, when will he text me back, to questions like, what am I? Now I'll be honest with you. I've been doing tarot readings for over two decades and I've never had a client come up to me and ask, what am I? I mean, that might scare me, but it would definitely excite me. But yeah, most people are not that interested in this type of existential speculation. I mean, who cares, right? People wanna know how to hurt less, how to feel good, how to live a happy and meaningful life, but, Having read tarot for over two decades and having coached so many people, there is an underlying question beneath all other questions, including will he text me back? Underneath all desires and all aversions, I would, I would boldly claim that there is a very subtle question and that question is, what am I? I mean, it's nothing new. The Oracle of Delphi coined this way back, right? Know thyself, but really, if you inquire deeply into your own life, I think you will find that every time you do get paid, every time you do get laid, every movement of your life's parade comes about from this underlying question, this underlying curiosity of what am I? I would argue that incarnation itself is a result of that question and maybe the creation of the universe. But don't worry, we're gonna get practical. We're gonna get to ending all suffering and saving the world. Based on my own research and my experiences, I've found that the highest levels of self-knowledge, which have to be by nature transcendent, like the ultimate self, I've found that reaching certain heights in that regard has brought me the most joy I could, I, than anything. The transcendental tarot through its symbolism expresses the mystical philosophy of the fool coming to learn who he is. And the closer you can get to the fool in that question of what am I, I, I really believe the closer you'll find that the root of all creation is a sort of question. This divine curiosity is seen in the suchness of Zen and the Ein Sof of Kabbalah, the One of Plotinus, the ground of being of Meister Eckhart. That very question is that which invisibly and eternally pervades all things, but is no one thing specifically. And when you recognize that you're part of this dance, you're part of this call and response that is ever present, that is always asking, that is always asking, what am I? You realize that there's nothing to lose. There's nothing you need to know. There's nothing you need to predict. There's not even a spiritual quest because 
this is it. And then the flip happens, the magical occult reversal, where the mundane world with its mundane questions about life, how do you get paid, laid, and unafraid, that becomes superstitious. And contemplations of eternity and this divine self that we all are, this one consciousness, that becomes obviously evident. Like literally self-evident. Like the most self-evident. Like nothing else could be more obvious. It's right in front of you. It is your experience. It is what allows for your experience. There, there cannot be anything else but this. And that's the fool. And when you realize that, the fool becomes the world. Consciousness becomes aware of itself. We echo Yahweh's claim, I am, with I am. Literally, this is self-evident in the most literal way. Oh, and there's a side effect. When you realize this, when you, when you identify with this eternal, self-evident, pervasive mystery, then uh, you start to end suffering. No, seriously, I can't tell you how much depression and anxiety I have reduced and eliminated from studying this stuff. It's affected my life and it's affected the lives of people around me. Or maybe I'm just crazy, but if I am, I'm glad I am because I'm having a great time. If you'd like to go down this wormhole with me, I have two programs coming up. Advanced Tarot and Mysticism for Misfits. Both are a deep dive with an amazing, loving international community, and I'm so excited to start. You can find more information about these programs in the link in the description, and I hope to see you in the next wormhole. Much love.